Welcome to Life Church. Welcome to everyone watching online. Uh, we hope you sing with us. To the King of glory and light, all praises. To the only giver of life, our maker. The gates are open wide. with his blood our savior the cross has overcome we worship you Great, your love is greater. 
in any other, for there is none other name given under heaven among men whereby we must be saved. Aren't you glad for the name of Jesus today? Let's thank him for that today. Amen. 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 You may be seated. If you are a guest with us, we'd just like to say how wonderful it is to have you. If you call Life Church home, could you just welcome all of our guests with a hand clap right now? It's great to have all of you. And I'm going to invite a special guest uh, to greet us this morning, and that is, we can't, I can't figure out what the relational name for it is, but this is my new son-in-law's father. So he's my son-in-law father. I don't know what it is. But anyway, his name is Clay Bolin. He pastors in Kansas City, uh, Missouri, and this wild man is riding his motorcycle all over this area. Rode the tail of the dragon the other day and all of that. But uh, so glad we've become friends, obviously, through our uh, kids coming together. And so good to have him today. I'm just going to have him come up here and greet you. Uh, one thing of note, just last week he became Dr. Clay Bolin. He just finished his Ph.D., so congratulations. Some people graduate from college in their 20s. He's 61. What can I say? Anyone? Come on up, Clay. Greet everybody. I think they put that on your uh, on your diploma. Call it some will come later. You know. <laughs> I'm a pastor at Northwest Bible Church in Kansas City, and uh, it's just really, really nice. I think I've just decided with Phil and Melanie, I'm just going to call them family. And, uh, you know, we, uh, our kids got married to one another. In fact, uh, on my trip, I went through and saw them in Arkansas. Been over about eight states and um, been about, well, I'm at about 2,200 miles. It'll probably be over three before I get home, but I like to fly solo and get out on the bike and rode all the Smoky Mountain trails here the other day and and with the new uh, with the new degree I'm going to get me a personal license plate and it's going to say Dr. Rev on it <laughs> well the Rev goes with the bike so but anyway I'm really glad to be here and I listen to listen to Pastor Phil online every week he's the one who preaches to me so uh, you are very very blessed to have these folks ministering to you here and Man, what a praise and worship team. We even have Wounded Warrior up here at the keyboard. <laughs> and I just want to praise God for Life Church and what God's doing here and ask that the Holy Spirit would fill Pastor Phil this morning as he, as he speaks. So, anyway, God bless y'all. Hello everyone, welcome to Life Church. Whether you're joining us online or in the building, we are so excited to have you here. Small groups are how we care for each other. And whether you're meeting online or six feet apart, there is a small group for you. This semester, we have a wide variety to choose from and signing up is super simple. You can sign up on the Church Center app or on lifechurchknoxville.com under the Life Groups tab. You can click or tap on the link there to see all of the groups we have and easily sign up as well. This works on a PC or a mobile device. And of course, out in the lobby after service, our small groups pastor, Jana Sally, will be more than happy to answer any questions you have and help you sign up as well. Emerald Youth will begin on Wednesday, September 9th. This fun group will help your kids learn more about Christ and how to be a leader in their community. We will be meeting from 6.30 p.m. to 7.30 p.m. This is open for children aged kindergarten through eighth grade. We are really excited to see what God will do in our youth this year. Thank you for your continued giving. Through your generosity, we are still able to provide these services as well as support our missionaries. There are four ways for you to give. Number one is online at lifechurchknoxville.com through our giving page. Number two is the Church Center app. Number three, you can mail in your donations to 1015 Cedar Lane, Knoxville, Tennessee, 37912. And number four is if you're in the building today, you can drop off your offering in the bucket at the door as you exit. Well, that's it for this week, Life Church. Remember to check us out on Facebook, Instagram, and at our website, lifechurchknoxville.com. We'll see you next time. Bye.
Good morning, everyone. Once again, it's great to see all of you and excited about this new series that we're in on Exodus, the road to freedom. Uh, God is so good, and I'm, I'm, I really had fun with our last series. In fact, we have a guest today that said he didn't recognize me without my swimming suit on. I uh, had, had seen this online. I do want to point out to all of you watching online how much that we uh, appreciate you and love you and... Uh, one of our elders, um, Eulen Washburn, he prays with me before these Sunday morning services, can't get out yet, and we totally understand that, and so many of you that are still watching online and encouraging and supporting of the church, it means a lot. I think it's probably a good time just to point out uh, one of our staff members and how much uh, that they mean to everything that we're doing, and that is Wes Wood. Wes Wood keeps us online every Sunday. He's running the camera back there, and I just want to thank him right now for all of his service, all that he does. That was his wife you saw doing announcements. I'm going to invite Jana to come up and do a, uh, the opening reading this morning. Um, Emmalyn, who you saw on keyboard, yes, was wearing a crutch. Uh, she called me very timidly because she just started an internship with us, and she said, I cannot confirm or deny whether I was on a skateboard the other day. <laughs> Uh, on campus, but uh, Emily, be, pray for Emily because she is going to be having surgery on Wednesday. They're actually going to have to pin that ankle together, and she told me she's on about a 5 out of 10 pain scale this morning, so she was, she was ministering under duress, so I really, really appreciate that. Uh, so, Jan, if you'd come up and read to us from Exodus chapter 3, uh, verse 1. One day, Moses was taking care of the sheep and goats of his father-in-law, Jethro, the priest of Midian. And Moses decided to lead them across the, the desert to Sinai, the holy mountain. There, an angel of the Lord appeared to him from a burning bush. Moses saw that the bush was on fire, but it was not burning up. This is strange, he said to himself. I'll go over and see why the bush isn't burning up. When the Lord saw Moses coming near the bush, he called him by name, and Moses answered, Here I am. God replied, Don't come any closer. The ground where you are standing is holy. I am the God who was worshipped by your ancestors, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Moses was afraid to look at God, and so he hid his face. Before we go any further, and this is not gimmicky, I thought that I would truly do this just to maybe as an illustration point out the holiness of what we're getting ready to hear this morning. Uh, not my words, but God's word this morning. I'm going to take off my shoes. And if anyone would like to take off your shoes, I just would invite you to do it because you're getting ready to hear some, some things that are really going to... Um, be a word from the Lord for you today, and as you hear it, maybe this will be one way that you're going to remember this particular morning, as you stood here, as you sat here without your shoes on. Some of you are wishing you had not worn holy socks right now, I understand, but, and you don't have to do it, but if you'd like to take off your shoes, feel free. There's a gap between the birth of Moses last week, Bonnie, would you hold this for me? between the birth of Moses last week and where we find Moses today. Everything last week ended on this incredible, optimistic, hopeful note. Moses, if you weren't there, Moses, who should have been thrown into the Nile River and either drowned or been eaten by crocodiles, was not, because they made a, an ark for him, they, 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 they waterproofed it, they, they, they put him in it, and, and not only did he not die, but as they sent that little ark away, it went right down to Pharaoh's daughter's house. Pharaoh's daughter, the, 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 the very Pharaoh himself, he, he's raised as a prince of Egypt. The sister is watching, and the sister says, I've got someone that could come and nurse this child for you. And his own mother nurses the child. 
We ended last week saying his name was Moshe, which is the sound that, that, uh, of, of bringing him out of the water, Moshe. And we talked about grace, how sweet the sound. And we talked about the fact that it looked like Moses' life was heading toward becoming the great deliverer of his people, that these slaves would be free at last. And now in chapter 3, we find Moses many years later. In fact, by history, we know that he was an 80-year-old man by now. There was no delivery of his people. This is about the time that Moses should be taking social security checks, checking on his 401k, retiring where he has spent his life. He has spent his life working for his father-in-law. How did we get from the hope of last week to the absolute mundane average life that he's living now? How did he go from being Moses the freer to Moses the farmer? What happened in the interim there? (laughs) Well, we didn't take time to read that story, but Moses, as he's growing up, he's, he's got this sense of destiny in him, and his mother's telling him, who he is, and he realizes, I am not an Egyptian. I am not the son of Pharaoh's daughter. I am one of the Hebrews. And one day, he sees an Egyptian that's mistreating one of the Hebrew slaves, and he is so incensed by what he sees that this righteous justice inside of Moses rises up in him, and he takes matters into his own hand, and he kills the Egyptian that's abusing the slave. The next day, he sees a couple of Hebrews that are having a dispute, and and Moses goes to break up the dispute, and one of them says, well, what are you going to do? You're going to kill us like you did the Egyptian the day before? The word had gotten out. I never knew this before, but there's a reason that Moses leaves this life Beside the fact that he was just afraid for his life and afraid of Pharaoh. But we find it in the New Testament when Stephen is giving his speech before he becomes the first martyr. And I didn't know this until my son-in-law's father, Dr. Clay Bolin, pointed it out to me. He pointed out to me that in that speech, Stephen says that when He kills the Egyptian. Moses fully expects that the Hebrews are going to rise up and they're going to follow Moses and that's going to be the moment that that he leads the people out of Egypt and into the promise. But instead, the slaves acted like slaves. They didn't act like an army. They didn't act like uh, they they were going to follow Moses. They weren't about to follow this Moses. They'd they'd been through enough suffering, and they, they knew the suffering, the additional suffering that could come from it. So Moses runs for his life. He goes to this area called Midian. He, um, long story short, marries his uh, his his wife there, and uh, and and he works for his father in law. And the scripture says. He does this for 40 years. Moses' life is really in, in, in 40 neat, 40 year periods. 40 years he spends in Egypt. 40 years he spends working for his father in law. And the last 40 years he spends um, freeing God's people. So we find him here at the end of this second 40 year period. Incredibly, <coughs> he walks up to this bush, and the Hebrew word for the bush is Sena. The anglicized, anglicized version, we would spell it S E N E H in English. Sena is the expression. And the reason that, that that's significant is 
is it's not just any bush, it's a, it's a prickly bush. It's a, it's a thorny bush. It's a, it's a bramble bush. There's this thorny bush uh, that, uh, that, that, that is just uh, prickly, and, and he sees the most strange thing. It's on fire, and it's not being burned. And he hears a voice saying, take off your shoes because the ground that you're standing in is holy ground. And if you're taking notes today, I want you to notice this. The ground is holy because of the presence of God. It's interesting when you read the passage, he calls the holy mountain. There's no reason that people would have thought of Sinai as the holy mountain at that point. Nothing in that point of history that we know about ever happened on Sinai that was holy before this time. And yet, as the writer of Exodus looks at this place in retrospect, he looks at the mountain and says, oh, this was a holy mountain. Spoiler alert, it's not just for what happens here right now. But there's going to be another event that happens right at this very spot on Sinai that's going to be the holiest event possibly in the Old Testament, the giving of the law. And so he's right there where he has no idea what God's going to do in this place. He has no idea what the future is, but it is, it is holy because of the presence of God. I, I'll never forget when we were pastoring in southern Illinois and we had a church, it was a little bit bigger than this, but, but similar, it was a traditional brick kind of church, and we outgrew the church, and we had, a, we had a Christian school with a gymnasium. And when we outgrew the church, we decided to move to the gym. And I'll never forget when we first came to the gym, how odd it felt to do praise and worship in the gym. I mean, we're sitting there singing these songs about the holiness of God with basketball hoops sitting up there right in the middle of our sanctuary. You, you know, um, when you called people to the, uh, to, to, to the uh, altar, you had to call them to the sidelines of the basketball game. The line that was marked out was the place that you go. And I remember it just feeling kind of odd and awkward until... I don't know. I don't know that it was the first service. Maybe it was the third, the fourth service. God's presence just became so powerful in that place that suddenly the basketball goals disappeared from our memories and from our peripheral vision. And suddenly that little basketball court became holy ground. This week I got to visit the Greek Orthodox Church in town, part of Chris Irwin's group that he's uh, leading these, these kids in this gap year is to, uh, to expose them to different experiences. So I think I have a picture of the Greek Orthodox Church. Uh, you know, so, now that's a cool church, you know what I'm saying? Uh, look at that. I mean, when you, when you go to that church, what you can't, behind that glass, there's an altar. Only the priest and the, the Orthodox men can go in that place. There's just that sense of holiness in that place. I can tell you this morning that it's not how ornate the building is. Amen. It's not how much uh, uh, artwork that you have on the outside. There's a place when a dusty old mountain uh, and, 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 and ground that looks like it's, it's arid and dry can become the place of the presence of God. And God can say, take off your shoes, Moses. Take off your shoes because the place that you're standing on is holy ground. In the bush we see both the transcendence, this is a big theological word for you, the transcendence and the essence of God. It's transcendent in the sense that it repels about that fire and Janna read it this morning that makes Moses want to hide his face. But there's also a voice in the fire that says, come near, come near. 
And when, when you hear that, 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 that sense, I, I really believe that in our experience of God, we need both of those experiences. We need the eminence of God, and we, we, pray, we sing praise and worship, and we sing about Jesus as if he's our friend. I am a friend of God, one of the songs uh, that we used to sing. Um, but, 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 but he's not just our friend, amen. He's also the awesome, omnipotent, all-powerful, omnipresent ruler of the universe and this transcendence of God, this transcendence of God is experienced and the eminence of God at this burning bush. When we come to church, we are summoned to experience both his transcendence. The Bible says that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of of wisdom. Oh, what do you mean? Be a, you know what fear means? Fear. <laughs> in, in Hebrew, it actually means that. <laughs> it, it's the fear of the Lord. That, 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 that Moses was a, afraid. That there's, something, uh, that there's something about the presence of God that we can be so casual about that we don't understand his holiness if we don't have that sense of his awesome presence, his holiness. He's both eminent and transcendent. Amen. I'm going to ask Clay to come up, and if you'll do the second part of the reading, if you'll hand him the microphone. The Lord said, I have seen how my people are suffering as slaves in Egypt, and I have heard them beg for my help because of the way they are being mistreated. I feel sorry for them, and I have come down to rescue them from the Egyptians. I will bring my people out of Egypt into a country where there is good land, rich with milk and honey. I will give them the land where the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites now live. My people have begged for my help, and I have seen how cruel the Egyptians are to them. Now go to the king. I am sending you to lead my people out of this country. Amen. Amen. The burning bush represents also the suffering of God's people. I, I pointed out this prickly bush, that it's this bush and, and, and God's people were, were, were suffering and they're, they're, they're under the load of slavery. There's nothing more dehumanizing than slavery. They've been whipped and they're in chains. Treating people like animals is terrible and some of you have come through some thorns in your own lives. Some of you have, have experienced some abuse in your life, whether physical or emotional or verbal. Maybe, maybe you've had a thorny past. Maybe you have turned to drugs and alcohol in the past. And I want you to think about that when you think about those thorns. But watch, the thorns are not the end of the story because the bush is on fire. But somehow, somehow, the leaves are not consumed. The leaves not being consumed represent God's people have not only suffered, but oh, they're resilient. The holy thing that I want you to hear today that's worth taking your shoes off to hear is not only have you been through some things, not only has your life had some misery, not only have you had some thorny experiences in your life, but God looked at Moses and it was Moses who had given up on his dreams. It was Moses who had decided for farming instead of freedom fighting. It was Moses who once uh, had a sense of destiny, 
But now he's in a desert. And God looks at Moses and says, Moses, it's been a thorny time that you've gone through. But let me tell you something. You're still standing. And as I look at, the, as I look at God's people who have been suffering now uh, in Egypt for almost 400 years of, of, of suffering that these folks have been there. They've been through everything. And, and, and we can say, we can talk about, oh, poor Israel, poor suffering, and all of that. And God has compassion uh, on their suffering. But when God looks down at the people, he's not just amazed at their suffering. What's really amazing is that they are still standing. And I want to introduce another word into this story to you today, and that's the word resilience. Because a lot of us, when we think about our lives, we think, what's wrong with me? We, we, could, we, could list, we could give you a detailed list of, and we've, and we've heard those messages, what's the matter with you? I want to ask a different question this morning, Dan. There's something really right about you. Everything that you've been through in life, and maybe you've been through the drugs, and maybe you've been through the alcohol, maybe you've been through the divorce, maybe you've been through the abuse, but, but somehow, for some reason, in spite of all of the fire, you're still standing. There's something about you that has not succumbed to the fire, and you're still standing. Those leaves have not burned, and, and, and Moses is standing there, and he's speaking hope into this guy who's given up on hope. Uh, Bonnie sent me a, a great little video yesterday, and it was Francis Chan, and he was, he was imitating how most Christians live their lives, and he, was, he had this balance beam, and instead of walking on a balance beam, he's underneath the balance beam with his legs wrapped around it and his arms wrapped around it, and he's just hanging on, and he kind of imitated the Christian who says, I'm not, I'm not going to do anything big for God. I'm just trying to survive. I'm not going to do anything amazing for God. I'm just going to try to make it. Yeah, I'm not going to do, I've given up on my dreams, you know. I'll, get, I'll come to church. I'll give a little bit of money. I'll tip God when the, when the offering plate goes by. But, but I'm not going to do anything. I'm not going to put myself out there because last time I did that, I know what happened. And God speaks to that. Moses, who's been through all of that, he says, Moses, you're still going to go talk to the king. I've still got dreams for the people. I've still got plans. I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. Hallelujah. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and plans to give you a future. I'm preaching to some people this morning. Maybe you're here today and you're just a survivor. And maybe you've got a list that's a mile long of everything that's wrong with you. And everything you can list everything that's happened to you. I came to tell you that God wants you to take off your shoes and hear something different this morning. That in spite of everything, in spite of everything, those you, you can take their, their sons away. But let me tell you, you can't, you can't do it. The midwives refuse to kill those baby boys. They, they keep growing. They keep prospering. God keeps blessing even through bad times. For some, there's something, and, and resilience is this ability to bounce back. Psychology today defines it this way. Resilience is the ineffable quality that allows some people to be knocked down by life and come back stronger than ever. Rather than letting failure overcome them and drain their resolve, they find a way to rise from the ashes. In a nutshell, resilience can be defined as the ability and tendency to bounce back. I'm looking at a church this morning in the middle of a pandemic. I'm, and we could talk about, oh, poor us. Look at what this pandemic has done to us. Look at what it has done. But you know what I want to say this morning? In spite of the fact that, uh, that, that jobs have been lost, in spite of the fact that, uh, unfortunately, people have died, un and in spite of the fact that there's been economic downturn as a result, somehow, in the middle of it all, God has 
wants you to hear right in the middle of a pandemic, hallelujah, that you're still standing and he still has plans for you and he still has hopes for you. He still has plans for Life Church. He still has plans for Northwest Bible Church. He still has plans for you, Clay Bowen. He still has plans for every one of you. And you can list everything that's wrong, everything that's the matter with you. And God looks at you and says, there's something strange. He says, turn aside, Moses. This is a strange sight, a strange sight, a bush that burns and somehow its leaves do not wither. That's amazing. I don't know, Wesley, I'm sorry, I forgot where I asked you to put that picture, but do we have the picture of the, the burning bush? Um, if we can find it, it's... Um, it, the, the oldest monastery in the world exists right here at the base of Mount Sinai. It's been in existence since the 500. Some people believe these are actual cuttings from the original burning bush that are still there. And there's, the, there's a chapel that you can go into at the base of that mountain. And chapel, you have to take your shoes off. It's the chapel of the burning bush. This morning you're in the chapel of the burning bush. God is in this place. God in his transcendence. God in his imminence. God who is awesome, but God who embraces you. God who is to be revered, but the same God who calls you. He's here this morning. And suffering will not have the final word. God is not finished with you, Moses. Finished with you, sir. God's not finished with you, ma'am. God's on the move. Your life has been like a thorn bush, a sena, but it's not the end of the story. I'm going to ask you, Bonnie, if you'd come and read the last portion of the scripture. I was going to apologize for preaching a little long last Sunday until I heard President Trump. Spoke 70 minutes the other day, but I promise I won't, okay? <laughs> but Moses said, who am I to go to the king and lead your people out of Egypt? God replied, I will be with you, and you will know that I am the one who sent you when you worship me on this mountain after you have led the people out of Egypt. Moses answered, I will tell the king, I will tell the people of Israel that the God of their ancestors worshiped has sent me to them. But what should I say if they ask me your name? God said to Moses, I am the eternal God. So tell them that the Lord, whose name is I Am, has sent you. This is my name forever, and it is the name that the people must use from now on. Moses goes to tell God all the reasons. That, that's my okay. sermon. <laughs> now you're reading my sermon. Moses goes to tell God all the <laughs> Thank you, Bonnie. Moses has a list of why he can't do it. If we would read further, there's, there's a whole bunch more discussion. I thought about the stuttering thing. You know, we, we've heard about that with Joe Biden with his issue with stuttering. And stuttering, stuttering sometimes has, a, has a, a point in our history where something happened to us, and, 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 and sometimes that's when the stuttering started. Uh, thought about Moses and I wonder if he started stuttering at about the time when he went after that Egyptian and the people didn't follow because there was a, there was a stutter in, in the plan there was that break in the plan there was a break in that upward thing and so Moses becomes a stuttering farmer complains to he, I have the list of every reason why I can't do it. And some of you have a list 
of why it's okay for you to attend church, but you are disqualified from ever doing anything more than that. Hear the word of the Lord this morning. It's not about you. It's about who is for you and who is with you. If it was about if it was about you, you would be a stuttering, faltering. But our mission is not about us. Our mission is not about great leadership. It's about a great God. It's not about a stellar, clean as a whistle past. It's about a God who sees resilience in us in spite of the prickly bush, in spite of the pain and the suffering that we've been through. He sees every sparrow that falls. not about how good you are. It's about how good God is. He says, not only that, but you got my name. You got my name. My name will bring you from your pain to the promise. What's your name? What's your name? One of the strangest answers. The Greek rendering of the Hebrew word I am, which is found in the Greek version of the Old Testament called the Septuagint, is ego a me. It's a weird, it's a weird conjugation of the verb to be. It's a timeless verb. It it it, it doesn't when we when we just hear the word I am, it has the present tense, but it's more than present. It's past. It's present. It's future. It means that God says, I am with you. I always have been with you. I was with you in your suffering when you didn't even know I was there. I saw it. I was there. I will be with you. I am. I am. Same, same phrase comes up over and over in the Gospel of John when Jesus says, I am the bread of life. We don't really get it in English. In, in, in Greek it says, ego eimi. He says, before Abraham was, ego eimi, I am. Jesus was equating himself with the eternal God who was and is to come. Someone ought to leave today with great hope in your hearts to know that God has never left you, that God is with you. And, 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 and it's almost like God says, you don't have time to know my name because my name is going to be an unfolding revelation in your history. And when you are needing healing, you're going to find me to be Jehovah Rapha, my healer. As you go through life, I'll be El Shaddai, your supplier. Not the God who's enough, but the God who's more than enough. You're going to find that I'm Adonai, your Lord. You're going to find that I'm, when you don't know how you're going to make it, you're going to find my name with you, and my name's going to be Jehovah Jireh, your provider. Jehovah Nisi, when you need victory, I'm going to be your banner of victory. Oh, when you need cleansed of your unrighteousness, I'm going to be Jehovah Sitkanu, my righteousness. Because my righteousness, Paul said, is as filthy rags. But I've got the name 
of God with me. I stand here not by my righteousness, but because of his righteousness. When I'm troubled, you're going to find me. I am Jehovah Shalom, your peace. When I need direction, I'm going to be Jehovah Rohoi, your shepherd. And when you wonder where I am, I'm going to be Jehovah Shema, your abiding presence. The last thing I want you to know from this passage today, if you leave today feeling anything but blessed about what God sees in you, you miss the message because God wants you to leave today knowing that in spite of everything you've been through, in spite of your sin, in spite of your failures, in spite of what's been done to you, you're still standing. And I love, I love this. There's a, there's a known passage in the Old Testament, but I love it. It says, even a live dog is better than a dead lion. If you got breath among the living, there's hope. If you're alive, there's hope today because God sees you and he believes in you and he's got plans for your life, Hannah. He knows. He cares all about all of it. And the last thing I want to say to you today is that take off shoes means you're in the presence of God. But there's another reason, especially in these ancient times, that you took off shoes. You took off shoes because you're finally home. Welcome home, Moses. Welcome home, Moses. Enough's enough. You know what Moses' first son's name was? Gershom. You know what it means? Stranger. He was born in Egypt as a Hebrew. He was a stranger in Egypt. He goes to Midian, and he's not a Midianite. He's a stranger in Midian. And then God says, I'll be your home. Welcome home, Moses. Take off your shoes. This is where you belong. Stay a while. And to somebody today, God is saying, welcome home. Enough's enough. Enough trying to do it on your own. Enough suffering under the brambles of the Sena. It's time for you to become everything that I made you to be. And don't feel the pressure because it's not about you. I don't care about your stutter. I don't care about your limp, Jacob. Your lips going to remind people it was all about me. Your stutter is going to remind people. When they see Phil Nordstrom and they see all of his flaws and all of his failings and shortcomings, they're going to know, wow, that had to be God. Welcome home. I'm going to invite us to bow our heads, close our eyes, worship team. God is offering you and inviting you a rich welcome home this morning. He's inviting you to lay down your self-loathing, insecurities, stutters, all of that, and just say, it's not about me, it's about you. So if you're here today and you just want to accept that invitation from God, stay with Moses. Okay. Okay. I can't do it. I need you, God. But okay. If you call me, if you say so, I'll answer this morning. 
If you're here today and you have not received Jesus yet as your Savior, I just invite you to say okay right now with your head bowed and eyes closed. Would you raise your hand in this place and say, here I am, Lord. Here I am, Lord. I give you my heart. Give me my future. Give me my life. If you're here today and you're just, you just kind of want to reaffirm in front of this burning bush with your shoes off, either literally or symbolically. Just here, here I am, God. I'm ready to do what you've called me to do. Here I am. We're standing on holy ground today. This little auditorium has become a sanctuary. prayed this morning before church I believe it was Natalie prayed this morning God let us see you, let us hear you let us taste you, let us smell you let us experience you in every way I pray that you do that today Lord I thank you for this congregation and I just bless them today and I speak the word of resilience over them today and I thank you, Lord, that in spite of everything that they've experienced, that they're still standing, and they're beautiful to you, and they're beautiful to me, and they're beautiful, and they have purpose and matter in Jesus' name. And all God's people said amen. Amen. Could you stand? Let us worship this transcendent and eminent God in 
I just want you and nothing else and nothing else nothing else will do I just want you nothing else nothing else nothing else will do just want you nothing else nothing else nothing else will do I just want you nothing else nothing else nothing else will do your presence I just want to sit here at your feet I'm caught up in this holy moment and I never want to just want you more than anything that you can do I just want you I hope that your time here this week has just been a pause middle of your week and the busyness and the cares, the concerns, sometimes the fears and the worries about what's going on all around us. I hope this has been a good moment for you just to pause. And and I, I pray that as we exit today, we leave with the sense that we've been in God's presence and that is a place of home for us. And I'm so thankful that he gives us that opportunity as we gather together and we, we focus on him and his presence. Let's bow in prayer as we close. God, I thank you for this day. God, we do leave today with the sense of your presence and with a longing to rest in your presence and with the knowledge that we need more of you, dear God. And I ask you to be with each person who leaves here today, Lord. You know the situations in their life. You know the concerns that they may have, any joys, anything that they may be facing this week that they're not even aware of yet. God, I ask you just to let your presence go with them and walk with them and surround them, Lord, and let your love be ever present, not only in their hearts and lives, but Lord Jesus, help them to be aware of that presence. We thank you and we praise you, Lord, for all those listening online, God. I thank you for them and I ask you to go with them wherever they go and whatever they do this week. We bless you and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.